this woman thinks I'm very funny, and now you're gonna be funny, so what am I gonna be? I'm gonna be a short, bald guy with glasses who suddenly doesn't seem so funny. Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y, and today I'm bringing you a video on arguably the most influential sitcom ever made, and the show that ruled the 90s, Seinfeld. Even over two decades later, its popularity hasn't died down, as Netflix just paid out a whopping 500 million to get it on their platform till 2026. So, in saying that, here it is, 25 facts you didn't know about Seinfeld. After season 9, NBC offered Jerry $5 million an episode to keep it going for another year. And even though that would have added up to somewhere around $110 million, he had to decline. Jerry said, I don't have a life, I'm not married, and I don't have kids. And now with a wife, three kids, and a Netflix show, it seems like he made the correct choice. Episode 20 of the fourth season, titled The Junior Mint, was special for a couple reasons. It won Michael Richards his first Emmy of the series and was also brought up as part of the court case McKenzie vs. Miller Brewing Company. Sometimes known as the Seinfeld case, it centered on an employee of Miller, Gerald McKenzie, who was fired after making numerous comments to a female colleague about the episode, which contained many inappropriate for work double entendres. Mackenzie initially won the verdict to an amount totaling $26 million, but this was later overturned by the Court of Appeals. Oh, come on, what do you say? Mulva. One of the more interesting storylines in the show involved George Costanza and his fiance Susan Ross, and her untimely death after licking closed her wedding invitation envelopes. Looking back, Jason Alexander explained how he and Heidi Swedberg had a very difficult time matching each other's comedy instincts and having any sort of chemistry at all. So, when Larry David announced that Swedberg was being kept on to play his fiance, Alexander protested, but to no avail. Nobody wanted to hear his plight until they all had to do a big scene with her and encounter the very same problem, which finally gave way to the verdict to kill her off. I'm so sorry, George. In season five, episode two, Jerry unintentionally agrees to wear the pirate shirt during an appearance on the Today Show. Well, this memorable moment will go down in history forever because the shirt was given to the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. It's not currently on display, but hopefully they put it back out there soon for everyone to see. And I said yes. Do you know why? Because I couldn't hear her. Seinfeld is commonly referred to as a show about nothing. But according to Jerry, the real pitch for the show when they presented it to NBC was a show about how comedians get their material. The part of a show about nothing was just a joke in an episode that caught on and took on a life of its own. What does that mean? <laughs> the show is about nothing. The soup Nazi in Seinfeld was inspired by a real Iranian soup vendor named Ali Yegana, who ran Soup Kitchen International in New York. Yegana complained several times about how the episode had ruined his life, and even went on a profanity-laced rant against Jerry when he visited the kitchen a couple weeks after the show aired. Excuse me, uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Excuse me. Can I have a bread, please? Michael Costanza, the real-life inspiration for the name George Costanza, filed a $100 million lawsuit against Seinfeld, claiming they violated his privacy by basing the character on his life. Luckily, the suit was dismissed, as the statute of limitations on the case had run out, as he did not file it within one year of the show's debut. In Season 5, Episode 9, The Masseuse, Elaine is dating a man named Joel Rifkin. During that time, there was another Joel Rifkin, only he was a serial killer who is believed to have killed around 17 women. Because of this, Elaine suggests that he change his name to something else, because of the associations people had at that time with that name. Guess you better 
keep on his good side, huh? <laughs> Very funny. That's One of the names she throws out there is OJ, seven months before he was charged with murder. Oh, please, please, please change your name to OJ. Please, it would be so great. What is going on? The finale of Seinfeld was truly a cultural phenomenon. It was watched by over 76 million viewers, making it the fourth most watched finale in American television history. During the showing, Frank Sinatra actually suffered a heart attack and was raced to the hospital in record time because everyone was at home watching Seinfeld. TV Land paid tribute by not airing any shows during the finale and instead put this up on their screen. Also, the night before, an episode of Dharma and Greg aired, which featured the couple trying to have sex in public because everyone will be inside watching Seinfeld. Every episode of Seinfeld had a different version of the theme song. This is due to the fact that the opening monologue where Jerry does his stand-up was never the same. The joke timing, the length, everything was different from episode to episode. So the theme song had to be as well. If there's a serial killer loose in your neighborhood, it seems like the safest thing is to be the neighbor. They never kill the neighbor. The neighbor always survives to do the interview afterwards, right? Test audiences absolutely hated the pilot. People found it annoying that the main character needed everything explained to him. They found him too wimpy. It was too New York and nothing happened in the show. One early viewer said, you can't get too excited about going to the laundromat. And test audiences weren't the only ones who had low hopes for Seinfeld. Larry David himself said goodbye to Jerry after filming the pilot thinking it was all over. And Jason Alexander thought there was no chance the show would actually make it. Because of how poorly the pilot tested, Seinfeld was given the smallest sitcom order in television history with only four more episodes being put on the burner for season one. It was also originally called the Seinfeld Chronicles before being renamed to Seinfeld after the pilot to avoid confusion with another show at that time called the Marshall Chronicles. Even though Seinfeld was never canceled, it wasn't really a big hit either. Early seasons of the show did all right, though that was mostly attributed to its prime placement right after Cheers. Season 3 of Seinfeld saw a change in the tide with the show receiving 8 Emmy nominations, but it wasn't until the 5th season that the viewership really skyrocketed. Julia Louis-Dreyfus was originally not the choice to be the lead lady in the series. That honor was supposed to go to Claire, the waitress at the local diner in the pilot played by Lee Garlington. But after careful consideration, it was agreed upon that the show needed a female who could hang out at Jerry's apartment often. This didn't seem like a plausible situation for Claire the waitress. So Larry came up with the idea for Elaine from an ex of his that he later became good friends with. Larry David famously enacted a policy in the writer's room of no hugging, no learning. Simply put, the characters must never learn any moral lessons, grow from their mistakes, or even feel bad about what they've done. He might die. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Lawrence Tierney, who played Elaine's father, Alton Baines, was mostly known for playing the villain in movies. His appearance on Seinfeld was one of the only comedic roles of his career. And according to the cast and crew, he did a fantastic job. So the plan was to make him a recurring character on the show. But things on the set got a little out of hand. For some reason, Tierney thought it would be a good idea to steal a butcher knife from a knife block in Jerry's apartment set. When Jerry asked him what he had there in his jacket, Tierney said he thought it would be funny to reenact a scene from Psycho, holding the knife above his head and making threatening gestures towards Jerry. The joke didn't go over too well with the cast, and Lawrence Tierney was never asked to return. When it came to meetings with the network, Larry David was not at all easy to work with. Even so far back as the pilot, he resented any changes made to his writing. 
and even said he has difficulty re-watching that episode because of the changes made to the script. One episode in particular almost caused Larry to quit Seinfeld. That episode was the contest in which the guys see who can go the longest without any sexual gratification. Larry thought the network executives would hate it and told himself that if he got any pushback, he'd quit the show right then and there. Thankfully, they loved the idea and Larry didn't have to go that far. But that didn't stop the executives from banning him from any network meetings altogether because of how argumentative he was. The episode titled The Revenge was based on a true story from Larry David's life. The year was 1984 and he had just gotten a job as a sketch writer at SNL. The only problem being that Dick Ebersole, the producer and David's boss, didn't like his sketches and cut all but one of them for the whole year. One night, minutes before the show went on air, David had another one of his sketches cut and he went ballistic, saying the show was a piece of shit, I quit, f you, the whole bit. Later, at his apartment, he discussed the situation with his next door neighbor, Kenny Kramer, the real life inspiration for Seinfeld's Cosmo Kramer, who told him to simply go back into the office on Monday and pretend like it never happened. Larry did just that, and it worked like a charm. Although the same can't be said for George in the show. Is that Costanza over there? <laughs> what are you doing here? As I just explained, Kramer was based on Larry David's real neighbor, Kenny Kramer. During the pilot episode, they called him Kessler to avoid any legal issues, but starting with the second episode, they went with Kramer after getting the real Kramer's approval to do so. Surprisingly, the real Kramer was reportedly only paid $1,000 for the use of his likeness, but he's found other ways to cash in, mainly by running his own reality tour bus and even becoming an ordained minister to marry couples. Season 3, Episode 3, The Pen, was the only episode in all of Seinfeld that Jason Alexander wasn't a part of, which may not sound like a big deal, but Alexander actually threatened to quit the show if they left him out of any more episodes. Jerry Seinfeld was the first television actor to make $1 million an episode for the final season of the show. An absolutely insane amount of money, but even that pales in comparison to the residuals he earned in the next couple decades. After accounting for syndication deals, merchandise, DVD sales, and streaming rights, Jerry Seinfeld could very well be the first comedian to be worth over a billion dollars. God, you're rich. <laughs> oh yeah. If you go back and watch some of the earlier seasons, it's apparent the audience loved Kramer, as his iconic entrances were met with tons of applause and cheers. Hey, hey. Hey. But at a certain point, it became so prolonged, everyone started complaining that it was ruining the pacing of their dialogue. So the producers put the kibosh on it and got the audience to end their cheering. Uh, we're ordering uh, Chinese food. If you want anything, let me know what it is and uh, I'll order it. The first and last conversations in Seinfeld are almost exactly the same. The second button literally makes or breaks the shirt. Look at it. It's too high. The second button is the key button. It literally makes or breaks the shirt. Look at it. It's too high. There were a couple more reasons why Jerry Seinfeld decided to end the show with season 9. For one, the number 9 means completion in numerology as it's the last of the single digit numbers and also the highest in value. Jerry also explained how the Beatles were together for 9 years and left the world wanting more, which is exactly what he wanted for Seinfeld. Astute fans will have noticed that Jerry's stand-up segments ended with season 7. This coincided with Larry David leaving the show, and the two events were directly related. With Larry gone and Jerry taking on much more of a creative and writing role in the show, he didn't have the time to craft additional stand-up material, so the segments were dropped for good. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave me a like and don't forget to subscribe. All right, till next time, everyone. Have a great day.